Hello and welcome everyone to our weekly town hall. We are very happy to be here with you. We're very happy that you all have been able to join us. Uh, as usual, we have some great information we wanna share with you that we know you're gonna find fun and exciting. And we're, we're just, you know, every week we're happy to do it. We, but we do wanna let you know the season is coming towards a close as far as the growing season. We know there are things that we do over the winter time uh, with our gardens as well. So what we're going to do for our schedule, and I'll repeat this again at the end, is that this week and next week are going to be our last two weekly presentations for our horticulture town hall, but then we will be moving to monthly presentations, and I'll have that schedule up and ready for you at the end here. We're um, happy to present to you uh, the different folks that are going to be on uh, today. So here is a map of all of us that are in horticulture across the state. We're always happy to answer your questions, whether it be today on the town hall or just email us in general. Um, you'll notice that some of the spots are open. Don't worry about that if you're in one of those counties. Just pick a name. We're all happy to email back and forth or even visit with you on the phone. Uh, if you need to send pictures, um, we're happy to accept those via email as well and answer your questions for you. We all just really love what we do and sharing the knowledge that we have. We have some folks that are going to do some great presentations uh, with some of the different things that have come in this week. Um, we've also got an update on something that I think is really important for us to know about as well. So we have Dr. Pat Ganan is going to uh, get us started with some of our uh, weather. We have folks across the state. Katie Kamler is on with us, as well as Justin Kay, Jennifer Shooter, Tamara Real, Kathy Meacham, Kelly McGowan, myself. I'm Debbie Kelly. Sorry, I didn't introduce myself in the beginning. I apologize for that. Um, Ramon Arancibia is also on today. And then on campus, we have Jared who is behind the scenes guy that we always know we need every single week, who does the fabulous work for us. And then we also have Dr. Kevin Rice from campus with an update that um, we uh, really wanna pay attention to. We also have Dr. Mandy Bish who is on campus. Um, she's sitting in and she's gonna be more um, uh, visible as we continue to move forward. So I at least wanted to introduce her and who she is for us as well. Kathy has changed her name to ask questions here. So if you've got a question on any topic or if you've got a question on a presentation that, that you're seeing during this hour time frame, send your question in the chat box to ask questions here. We'll make sure that we try to get it answered for you if we can during this hour long presentations that we have. Um, if we can't, we'll go ahead and someone will answer that question for you, but be sure to put your email address in along with that question. And we made Kathy as ask questions here, so it'd be private, so you don't have to worry about everybody seeing your email address. Um, but we're happy to be here, and I think we're going to go ahead and get started. So, uh, Pat, if you want to start us out with the weather, um, it's nice to see changes happening right now. It certainly is, Debbie. Thank you, and um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. What a great start to the first day of fall um, with these really pleasant temperatures and lots of sunshine and low humidities. It just doesn't get much better than this here in Missouri. Well, let's look back over the past three weeks. We're right at the September 22nd, and, and it's been a warm one, not only for Missouri, but uh, pretty much the entire United States. On the left, are the departure from normal temperatures for the first three weeks of September. And you can see those various shades of orange colors indicate above normal temperatures. So after we've had our warmest summer on record for the country, uh, by all means, it will be an above average month of September with only about nine days left of the month. On the right, you can see from Missouri how temperatures have been running for the first three weeks, generally about one to as much as four degrees above normal. So by all means, a very mild uh, first three weeks of September. And I think with the forecast over the next uh, 10 days, uh, it's not gonna change much. These temperatures are gonna remain above normal for the entire month of September as we wind it up. We really needed the rainfall and fortunately some of us got it, uh, especially over the past couple of days. We did have a strong cold front that moved through the state on Monday night and dropped those temperatures, but also as it moved through the state, it triggered a pretty good area of showers and thunderstorms. 
These are radar estimates over the past seven days. Again, most of this has fallen over the past 48 hours. Any of those greens and yellows are the folks who receive some decent precipitation, generally a half inch to up to two inches in the various shades of green, the dark, darker the greens, the heavier the precip. And then these yellow areas you see here in parts of central Missouri and in the southwest corner of the state, a little bit in southeast Missouri, that's two or more inches. So it's a very welcome rainfall. We were really dry here in mid-Missouri and we got some decent rainfall, which really helped out quite a bit. I will say I woke up on, um, on Tuesday morning with over an inch of rain in my gauge and you would look out and I saw no puddles. That really indicates how dry those topsoils were. It really soaked up the rainfall and uh, you know, <laughs> We can stand to use some more, but it's a good start to see these, the, the, this much rainfall, at least over the past couple of days. The totals here in the bottom show some actual rain gauge reports. They match up pretty well with the radar image. You can see Southwest Missouri, McDonald County, just west of Anderson, oh, nearly five inches of rain. And you can see that's where the heaviest rain fell across parts of Newton and McDonald County over the past uh, couple of days. Higher totals also in Newton County, Callaway County, where it's been very dry. They had over three inches just northwest here of Columbia and near Harrisburg, over three inches. And also parts of Cooper, Monoto, Barry, St. Louis, Butler County, over two inches to generally nearly two inches. So, so again, some decent rainfall, badly needed rainfall, and we still need it. Uh, this is uh, accumulated rainfall for the month of September. On the left, you can see the heaviest totals are in the blues. So areas around Kansas City and South, West Central parts of the state, they've seen some more rainfall. Uh, that recent event in far Southwestern Missouri, parts of East Central, South of St. Louis, Southeast Missouri, they've had some decent rainfall. Lighter areas across Northern parts of the state, South Central Missouri. On the right shows the departure from normal for the first three weeks of September. Any of these yellows or, or orange colors are below average. So that's despite what we just had over the past 48 hours. Uh, we're running below normal still uh, across much of the state, again, with the exception of these green areas where it's uh, above normal precip. So overall, the state is still looking pretty dry in regard to for the month of September. Current conditions, as I talked about at the beginning, how just how nice this weather is from about 10 minutes ago on the left, upper left. These are current conditions across the state. Many areas generally in the middle, the upper 60s. we got some lower 70s down here in the Boot Hill really nice conditions when you pair that up with here on the right with these dew point temperatures running in the 40s and 50s that's very pleasant it just doesn't get much better than that with these temperatures and low dew points we are uh, looking for some cool weather today in the lower left you can see these are the high temperature forecasts generally in the upper 60s lower 70s that's below normal for this time of year Generally this time of year in Missouri, high the average daily highs are in the mid to upper 70s. So we're actually running below normal for once today. Look at these low temperatures for tomorrow morning. These are some of the coolest temperatures we're, we've seen since, uh, since May for many locations with this low temperatures generally in the middle 40s across the state. You know, some of those low lying areas are gonna probably drop it down into the lower 40s. So some very cool conditions as we wake up tomorrow morning. We are gonna be warming back to more, up to more summer-like conditions. This pattern we're in now is not gonna be around for very long. Starting on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, up through early next week, you can see the forecast high temperatures. They are indicating, the National Weather Service is indicating a weaker cold front to move through the state on Friday. That really won't impact us with any precipitation because the air mass is so dry, but it will keep temperatures generally in the upper 70s for Friday and Saturday, and then look at Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, more back into the Summer-like conditions, the summer just doesn't want to let go yet, with high temperatures on Sunday, generally in the middle 80s, and into the upper 80s and middle 80s on Monday and Tuesday. I mentioned the precipitation or the lack thereof as we go into the weekend, and that's forecast for much of next week as well. This is a seven-day forecast of precipitation. You can see little to no precipitation for all of Missouri, for much of the western half of the country for that matter. Heavier precip is con uh, confined to a system impacting parts of the Midwest and the Ohio River Valley today and tomorrow with much heavier rainfall anticipated for Indiana and Ohio, but little to no rainfall here in Missouri is anticipated over the next seven days. This is a forecast for next week, the six to 10 day outlook. So that'll put us through the end of September into the first day of October. A high likelihood of above normal temperatures for much of the country, especially from the Rockies to the Midwest, 
Uh, here in Missouri, uh, all of the state is forecasting above normal temperatures. And I, as we had mentioned earlier, that could put highs generally in the 80s, maybe upper 80s early next week, and then persisting for the rest of the week as well with these above normal temps. On the right, it looks like this dry spell is, is re-emerging again uh, after this recent rain event with a high likelihood of below normal precipitation for pretty much all of next week. So Debbie, that's pretty much a weather report. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you, Pat. We always enjoy having you with us each time that we're on. The weather is uh, really important when it comes to our growing season and what we actually are able to do with our lawns and our gardens and our landscapes. So we appreciate it. Thank you very much. What I'd like to do is go ahead and turn this over to Jennifer and she's gonna be our moderator for today. Thank you, Jennifer. Yes, thank you, Debbie. And good afternoon, everyone. And to get us started on our topics, uh, Dr. Tamara Riel is going to do our weekly friend or foe. Thank you. So we are going to get started on this. Um, I am already sharing my screen so you can get started thinking about, is this a friend or foe? I just launched the poll, so you should be able to see that now. Um, you're going to let us know whether it's friend, a foe, neither, or it depends. And if you don't have access to the poll, you could always put your answer in the chat. I'm gonna give you just a few more seconds. All right, so just a couple more seconds and then I'm gonna end the poll. All right, here we go. Then I will share the results and hopefully you all can see that. So um, this, you guys, you guys are on it again. So yeah, this, this actually is a foe. Um, you can kind of tell, I gave you a pretty big, big hint with, if you looked at the surrounding area, um, this is a, a, a cross, let's see, a cross striped um, or cabbage worm and it eats cold crops. So let's, let's investigate this just a little bit more. Um, again, our cold crops are like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, collards. Um, in this case, it's the kale in my garden. You can see up here that um, they've pretty much decimated this one kale plant. And um, th this pretty much happened overnight as well. So uh, if, if you happen to see these caterpillars, know that they can eat a lot. Um, the adult moth, it's a rather nondescript little brown moth, um, but the larvae are quite colorful. They, I, I think they're really beautiful, but they are kind of destroying my plants. Um, they're about two to three generations per year. And um, this is a good time to be monitoring your cold crops right now because uh, there, there is that third generation or second generation happening right now. Um, and if you can find them right now, then it can help you not have a bigger problem later. Um, the way you manage these, you can always do it with uh, using a, a bucket of soapy water and picking, hand picking those, those plant or those uh, caterpillars. Um, you could also prevent them from getting there by placing floating row covers to prevent, to prevent the females from laying eggs. Um, and if you do need insecticides, BT and spinosids can be effective if the caterpillars are smaller than about three quarters of an inch. Um, after that, the insecticides are not effective. Keep in mind that there are beneficial insects out there that will also prey on these caterpillars. So using cultural and physical control methods or try using those before you reach for an insecticide. So that's all I have for today. All right, thank you, Tamara. And our next topic is the spotted lanternfly and Dr. Kevin Rice is going to tell us about that. All right, thanks for uh, letting me present here. And uh, can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, so I just wanna start out by saying, you know, uh, spotted lanternfly, we've been talking about it for a few years. Um, and most of the information that I'm going to be presenting today comes from my colleagues that work at Penn State, uh, Heather Leach and Danielle Kirkpatrick. They're both entomologists and they, uh, they sort of lead the spotted lanternfly research team because they live in the area where the epicenter of the invasion occurs. So a little background and real brief. I know we've discussed this probably in the past, uh, I think on this, uh, on, on this town hall. 
Spotted lanternfly is an invasive insect. It's native to Asia, and it was first detected in the mid-Atlantic in 2014. And uh, it's a flown feeder, like most plant hoppers, and it causes severe, severe economic damage to grapes. Uh, and the reason why we're talking about it again today is because uh, if you've been following some of the local news, you may have seen that a 4-H participant in Kansas uh, turned in his insect collection, which contained a pinned spotted lanternfly. Uh, and for the, that did launch a federal investigation. And it looks like uh, that uh, that kid was not traveling to Pennsylvania in the last few months and that he might have actually uh, collected that in the state of Kansas. So uh, a reminder, the update, this is what the nymphs look like. Uh, the adults, uh, you know, the brightly colored pink uh, elytra with the black spots. Uh, the, the nymphs sort of look like ticks, but again, they're, they're, they're sort of, when they get larger, they get this uh, abnormal red coloration. Uh, so if you look at the key characteristics, they are somewhat easy to identify from our native insects. Uh, the reason why we've been talking about them for a while now is because the females have this really unusual behavior where they lay their eggs almost indiscriminately on any flat surface, including metals, uh, stones, and wood. And uh, they found that the eggs have been laid on railroad cars and uh, semi-tractor trailers. And that's why we understand that the, the potential for hitchhiking and moving to new territories is pretty high. Uh, additionally, the, the adults like to hitchhike as well as the eggs. Uh, they found that uh, with wind tunnel tests that the, the adults can withstand and sort of hold on to materials with 65 mile per hour winds. So that's including cars as well. Uh, so both the adults and the nymphs uh, or and the egg cases are hitchhikers. And uh, this is just a video showing you the damage in grape and massive uh, populations because they're an invasive insect and they don't have a lot of natural enemies here. So that's why we uh, we call this enemy free space. Uh, so they have higher populations in the invaded regions. And here you can see uh, it's feeding on the phloem and squirting out this honeydew. Uh, that creates further problems down the line with sooty mold accumulations. So all the damage thus far, all the economic damage, the real damage in agriculture is uh, centered along uh, vineyards. So uh, you have a lot of leaf curling, honeydew buildup, and eventually you have vine death. So spotted lanternfly has actually killed entire vineyards in Pennsylvania. So that's pretty disturbing. Obviously growers uh, react with increased insecticides and that's, uh, that increases the cost of production. Um, and, and, and it's pretty, uh, it's a pretty severe key pest. That's what it looks like after a spray. That's how many are on these, uh, on, on the grapes. And uh, again, even when they kill these a week later, they're moving in from uh, neighboring natural, uh, natural habitats also. So you have to continually spray for this pest. Uh, there's just uh, more shots of the, uh, the enemy free space and the high populations that they experience in, in the mid Atlantic. Uh, and what I do want to stress, though, right now, currently, there is no reported damage to other agricultural commodities except grape. Uh, you might see spotted lanternfly occasionally in field crops and on vegetables, but most of the time they are not feeding and they aren't causing damage. Uh, however, they do cause damage to trees. So they, they feed directly through the hardwood. Uh, of a lot of our tree species. And that's, they, they become an economic nuisance pest for homeowners in the mid-Atlantic. So this is a picture of a, a backyard in Philadelphia. And of course, uh, that's not what anybody wants to experience in their, uh, in their living space. Uh, in addition to being a nuisance pest, when they get to this high populations level, they can actually drain and kill entire trees. So that's pretty impressive. And again, it just comes back to that high population level. Uh, Missouri does have a conditions or environmental conditions that are, uh, uh, that, are that, that, that will uh, be suitable for spotted lanternfly to establish. So that's why we're concerned about it and we're always looking out for it. The USDA is currently investigating biological control methods. There are some fungus uh, that are reported to kill them, but it's very, very early to see whether that will actually be a vi viable approach for uh, management. Uh, the USDA is also doing a classical biological control uh, investigation where they go to the where they go to the region where the insect is native and they try to find parasitoids that attack only that species. And again, this causes this creates a long 
study system. So they have to study these wasps. They have them in a quarantine facility in Beltsville, Maryland, and uh, they won't be released anytime soon. They have to be positive that they aren't going to attack any of our good native species. So um, I'm just letting you know that there's a lot of funding and a lot of research being uh, concentrated on spotted winged or, soft, or spotted lanternfly, uh, but the likelihood of a quick fix management option uh, is not anytime soon. Uh, one thing to do when you're scouting in your local areas, uh, there does seem to be an association with the with this tree, uh, tree of heaven, it's also an Asian invasive tree. And we find that uh, they spotted lanternfly uh, prefer to feed on this tree. So that's something to look for. Um, the Missouri Department of Agriculture is being extremely proactive. So, so they have been looking for spotted lanternfly throughout the state of Missouri every single year, even during COVID. They had scouting teams going to counties with railroads or vineyards and uh, they, they've been scouting hundreds of locations and they report that. And um, obviously there's not, not been any found yet in Missouri. Uh, if you do see something that looks like spotted lanternfly, uh, this is what we are asking you to do to report that information to the Missouri Department of Ag. So you can kill it, take a picture of it. Uh, they're pretty slow, clumsy flyers, so they don't escape well. And uh, additionally, Missouri Department of Agriculture also has an information flyer with more information and then the Penn State Extension site listed here has all the information you might need about management, life cycle, and biology and ecology. And again, Penn State's leading this because they have the populations in the field uh, that they can study. Uh, so the main take home message is uh, we aren't in a panic mode yet, uh, but it's something that we want folks in Missouri to be on the lookout for. And again, if we catch a population early enough, it may be uh, eradicated uh, with, 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 a, with a large response um, before it spreads to our vineyards in Missouri. Uh, and with that, I'll take any questions. Hey, thank you, Kevin. Uh, moving on. It does Paul's look like we have one question, Jennifer. Okay. How do the spotted lantern fly respond to wild grapes? Uh, they also feed on wild grapes so that, yeah, they, they aren't, they actually aren't too um, uh, picky when it comes to cultivars. Uh, there's a little preliminary studies that show that, you know, they feed on any kind so that it's still early, uh, but they will feed on wild grapes. Are there any lookalike insects? So, I mean, that's uh, dependent on your level of uh, entomology, right? So for me, I can say no, because I look at these insects every day. Uh, but there are some Arctic moths that look similar. Ticks look similar to the nymphs. Um, if you look at the, uh, the adults and you look really closely at that pink pattern and the polka dot pattern, uh, there isn't too many that really resemble that uh, quite so well. So uh, again, uh, if you, you can take a picture and ask us to ID it, you can send it to my email or uh, probably Tamra's or the Department uh, of Agriculture in Missouri. Just one more question, Kevin, if you've got time. What sure. types of trees do they attack? Sure. So they attack a lot of different tree hardwood species, but there does seem to be a preference for maple, black walnut, birch, and willow, but that's not the total list. So they, they do, and again, when they're at those extreme population levels, uh, they have to kind of pick any tree that's available to them when there's that many competition for resources. But yeah, maple, black walnut, birch, and willow seem to be highly preferred at this point in the early uh, sort of discovery of their ecology. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, moving on. Our next topic is on taking a soil test and fall is a good time to do that. And Justin Kay is going to tell us how to uh, take a soil test. All right, thank you, Jennifer. So as Jennifer mentioned, uh, fall <clears throat> is definitely a popular time of year to take a soil test. Um, it's good to do it in the fall because you can get the recommendations that you need to adjust um, nutrients or pH in your garden, and you'll have plenty of time to get all those materials um, before you go ahead and have to apply them um, to get your garden ready for the spring. So the first question we need to answer is why do we want a soil test? 
Um, we want to check the nutrient status of our soil. Oftentimes our soil is able to provide a fair amount of nutrients. Um, we might not necessarily need phosphorus or potassium depending on the soil that we have. We can understand what our soil pH is as well as our soil organic matter levels and whether we need to adjust any of those. Um, we can apply, we're gonna get recommendations to apply what's needed to support plant health and vigor. Um, it'll give you information on what your cation exchange capacity is. So for instance, with a low CEC and a very sandy soil, you might have to fertilize in small doses more often. Um, that's not too common in Missouri. We have a lot of soils with a good amount of clay, which will retain nutrients. You're going to receive both fertility and pH adjustment recommendations if needed for the plants that are selected on that soil test. And most importantly, uh, we want to minimize environmental impacts and make sure that we're not applying more nutrients than our plants need that could potentially run off um, onto the street or into our streams and bodies of water that can cause nutrient pollution issues. So when we take a sample, we don't wanna just take one little shovel full of soil um, because you could have like a little fleck of bird poop, for instance, that could make it look like you have really high phosphorus. So we wanna do eight to 12 subsamples kind of in a random grid pattern of the area that we wanna sample. And we wanna take that sample from the soil surface down to the depth of about six inches. So we want that whole little profile. You can use a small shovel, a hand trowel um, to dig a little sliver of a soil take eight to 12 of those, throw them in a bucket. We wanna sample problem areas separately. So for instance, if our back lawn always grows great and our front lawn always grows poorly, we might wanna sample those separately because there could be separate issues going on. Um, remove any leaves or sticks that might be in the sample and then air dry those subsamples, mix them all together. And then we really only need about two cups um, from those samples for analysis. Areas that are managed differently should be sampled separately. So your lawn is probably treated differently than your vegetable beds, which are probably treated differently than your ornamental beds, for instance. You might be applying different fertilizers, different amounts of compost and things like that. So you wanna sample those separately. Um, if you have you know, different soil types in your yard that are distinctly visibly different by color and texture, you might wanna sample those separately as well. Label your samples. Um, it's really easy to send this stuff off with some numbers, sample one, two, and three, forget where they came from. So label the samples and draw a map of your yard or your landscape for reference. I just wanna take a, uh, a look at a soil test report to kind of give you an idea of what you will be receiving in terms of your results. On the left-hand side, you're gonna get the actual values from the analysis. The right-hand side is basically just a relative rating of pH and nutrients, just to give you an idea of what might be critically low or excess. And then below there, you're gonna receive, receive fertilizer and limestone recommendations for the plants that you selected. Uh, on the left-hand side, we'll see that we have an actual pH value of 6.7 and organic matter of 18.2. So we have very high organic matter in this bed. The crop that was selected was azaleas, which are noted here as a strong acid loving crop. Um, because we have so much organic matter, there's not actually a nitrogen recommendation. Phosphorus is already very high in the soil. We can see that on the rating table above. Um, potash is medium, so we need a little bit of potassium to be added. Uh, but most importantly for this planting of azaleas, which are strong acid loving, we get a sulfur recommendation to help us lower our soil pH to an ideal pH for growing azaleas. So it's easy to invest a lot of money in plant material and not get those soil conditions adjusted prior to planting. Um, it does take about six months after the sulfur is applied um, for it to really take effect. Now you can apply it to the surface. It's best if it's incorporated. And if you have an existing tree or shrub that you'd like to lower the pH, you can use an auger to drill holes around the drip line and apply sulfur directly into those holes. Now I wanna show you this next one here. Um, if we look in the middle of that box in red, it says the crop that was selected was fescue, bluegrass and ryegrass. So cool season grass, cool season turf is the most common type of turf in the state of Missouri. We'll notice at the top that we have a pH of 4.6, which is pretty low. Um, organic matter of 4.0, which is a good percentage for a lawn. Um, and if we look at our fertilizer and limestone recommendations, we'll see that there's a large recommendation for lime. 
Um, this is because our soil pH is low and we need to raise our soil pH. Uh, most Missouri soils are at least slightly acidic. Um, this is a very strong acidic soil. So we have 225 pounds of lime recommended. But you'll notice in the soil test report, there's a lot of good information below in these notes. The first red box says, do not apply more than 50 pounds of lime per thousand square feet in one application. The second application can be made six months to one year later. So it's actually gonna take more than two years for this homeowner to get all this lime down. We, wanna, we would not want to apply it all at once because we could risk burning the turf. There's other notes in here, um, like when you're establishing a fescue lawn, apply one pound of nitrogen per thousand square feet in September and again in November. That's generally going to be calcium carbonate lime, uh, which is the most commonly one available. Unless otherwise noted, you might have dolomitic lime if you also have a magnesium deficiency. And these notes also reference a publication, um, this helpful MU lawn maintenance calendar, which kind of tells you what you need to be doing and when in your lawn. So a lot of good notes there. Make sure you read those and get all the tips that that might share. Now, I just want to reinforce the importance of pH here. Um, pH really impacts nutrient availability to a great extent. So if we look at phosphorus at a pH of 5 on the left and a pH of 6.5 in the center there, we'll see that the phosphorus becomes much more available at a higher soil pH. Um, you'll also notice the band of iron about middle way down. Um, it becomes much narrower at higher pHs. So this is why some of our heavy feeding iron crops like azaleas and blueberries actually prefer a lower soil pH. So most of our vegetable crops like to be between six and 6.5. They can be a little bit higher, um, but just note that some crops do prefer more acidic soils, both blueberries, azaleas, and plenty of a uh, good number of other ornamental crops as well. Now, I mentioned minimizing environmental impacts. Um, we wanna be responsible when we're using fertilizer. Um, nutrient pollution can cause issues. It can cause algal blooms, where you have a lot of algae growing in a pond um, or other body of water. When the algae dies, it actually robs the oxygen from the water, which can cause fish kills. So we wanna do our part, make sure that we're blowing fertilizer off of hard surfaces. So off of driveways, sidewalks, or roads and getting it back into the yard where the soil can absorb it. Um, all, you know, streams are oftentimes fed by rainwater that can come off of our, our hard surfaces, so we want to clean those up. We only want to apply the recommended amounts of fertilizer because that's all that our plants need. It's both a waste of money and potentially cause um, environmental issues if we're over applying unnecessary fertilizer. Slow release nitrogen fertilizers can also reduce runoff potential. So fortunately, a lot of the readily available lawn fertilizers now have different stabilized forms of nitrogen that release more slowly and don't become um, an issue as much with runoff. Just a couple notes here. Um, a lot of folks like to apply compost in the fall. Compost should really be thought as a soil amendment, not as a fertilizer. Compost can have impacts on soil pH as well as salt levels in the soil. Uh, too much compost or manure can cause excesses of phosphorus and potassium. Um, at, at very high levels, this can cause issues of nutrient uptake and other nutrients becoming unavailable in the soil. With too much manure, you can burn your plants. Um, you know, with compost, I think less is more. It's better to add a small amount annually than apply a ton in a single application. It's very easy to overapply in a small garden bed. Um, it's, it's easy to overdo it. I just wanted to let folks know not to raise the alarm, but there have been some issues with both contaminated manure and compost containing herbicide residues, which if tilled in the soil can prevent plants from growing. Um, that's basically pasture herbicides that are fed to livestock and then that herbicide carries through the manure and into any compost that might be made from that manure. So we have a, a publication that walks you through how to test your compost basically planting some green beans and green bean seeds in the compost as well as in some potting mix. We'll drop that link in the chat box so you can check out that article. With soil testing, you can drop off your soil samples, those two cups um, at your local extension office. We have an office in pretty much every county in the state. You can just Google your county name followed by county extension or MU extension. We also have an MU soil testing website. You can check out all the services on there. We have basic fertility analysis as well as tests for things like lead if you're in a city or urban area where that might be concerned. 
Soil testing in the fall um, is a great time to do it for the reasons I said earlier. And it is recommended at a minimum every two to three years to make sure that the adjustments that you're making are helping support the plants that you're growing. And that is all I have. All right, thank you, Justin, for that great information. Any questions from anyone, Kathy? No, nope, no questions. Okay, so we'll move on to our next topic. And that's on sweet potatoes. I know a lot of gardeners grow sweet potatoes and we have some growing here at the Adair County Extension Center as well as my house. And I've already had some questions from people wanting to know, when is it time to dig sweet potatoes? And Dr. Ramon Aaron Sibia is going to tell us about when we should dig them. Okay, let's see if we can put this up. Uh, there we have. Yeah, it's time to harvest sweet potato. Those people, those growers or, or gardeners that have put uh, planted sweet potato in the spring, uh, it's about time to harvest. Usually harvest sweet potatoes is uh, best uh, before a freezing. Hey, Ramon, if you have a presentation, we're not seeing it on the screen. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't click the last uh, portion. Is there right okay. now? Okay, I see it now, go ahead. All right, thank you. Yeah, I was, say, I was saying one of the things for those people that have uh, planted sweet potato is to understand that sweet potato is a perennial crop, a tropical perennial crop. And because it's tropical, it's kind of sensitive to a uh, temperature, cold temperature. So this is the time to harvest before a freeze event will come. But you have to also consider that chilling temperatures, what we consider chilling temperature is not necessarily freezing, but temperatures between 32 and 60 degrees, we consider those temperatures also will affect warm season crops like sweet potatoes. Uh, it produces a physiological problem that may affect the foliage as well as the roots. But at this time of the year, the soil is warmer, even though when a cold temperature lasts last night or this coming night, it's gonna be below 60 degrees and may affect a little bit the foliage, but the soil is still warm, so it, not, it won't affect much as, uh, uh, the roots. But if we wait too much in the season or, or a freezing event will come, it might have a much stronger effect on the roots since the, at least the surface of the, the, the field might be, or the, the soil it might go very low temperatures, yeah? So the main recommendation is you have to harvest before a freezing event. And when there is a chilling temperature, you gotta see how long does chilling temperature occur. For example, last we have last night and next night, uh, uh, tonight is gonna be, a chilling temperature, but during the day it goes above uh, 60 degrees, so the plant has the chance to recover. But when the chilling temperatures are too long, let's say five, seven days long, you're going to see that the foliage is going to be affected. It's going to start to reddish, redden uh, the, the foliage. You see red foliage stronger and stronger. And the longer time at those temperatures, the foliage cannot recover and practically they won't function again. So when that happens, the storage roots are not gonna grow, practically don't grow anymore for the rest of the season. But if they recover, they could keep growing. Next week it's gonna be warm again. So you might, if you wanna uh, let the, leave the, you could leave the, the potatoes in the ground for a longer time to see if they might grow a little bit more. But that depends on also on what, a size of sweet potato you want to have. What is, uh, for those that are commercially, what's the market that they have? And uh, if you are a home grow, uh, home uh, garden uh, owner, uh, you might wanna see what are you gonna use it for? Normally the medium size of sweet potato is what we call the baking size. And by the USDA standard is usually between one, one three, four quarters of uh, of uh, inches to three and a half inches in diameter. Those are the medium size uh, baking sweet potato. Larger than that are the jumbos. They're still good. You can eat it. They usually are used for a uh, cooking casserole type of uh, uh, dishes. And in the commercial uh, 
uh, growers, they send those to, for processing. You can have usually to make sweet potato fries, they like those jumbo size, big sizes, but so the sweet potato fries can be long and, and uh, those are more uh, uh, better sold uh, in the market. And those that are smaller than the medium size and the baking size, are the, those are called canners because also they go to the processing industry so they can make a paste or baby food with those two. They also, the processing industry also uses the uh, large, the jumbo size too, yeah. But uh, so what is your market on one side or what you wanna do with the sweet potato? It will tell you when it's time to harvest or you wanna leave it longer in the season, but always harvest before freezing uh, event. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see in this picture, there are several sizes. For example, the, this one here is a, kind of borderline uh, reaching kind of the jumbo size. Same as this one on the side is the jumbo size. These two on the, on, the, on the left are practically the medium size for baking a sweet potato. And this one in the middle between the two large ones is practically a canner or small size uh, sweet potato. So normally it's recommended to scout the, uh, the field to find what's the proportion of uh, the, 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 the size of sweet potatoes that you want. If you're commercial, you look for the, the, the highest value, of course, is the medium size, uh, most demanded for baking, and that has the uh, highest price. So you would like to have the highest proportion of that sweet potato. This is another way to look at them. Uh, you harvest a, a certain, let's say 10 feet, and you separate it, and you're gonna see uh, some differences in, in, uh, in uh, the sizes, and you can separate it here in the middle are the uh, medium size, essentially. On the right, there are the jumbos, and on the left, there are the uh, small uh, sweet potatoes or the form sweet potatoes or, uh, that are in, the, in that field. Uh, normally, when you harvest commercially, you may have about 50% of the medium size this can vary depending how early or how late in the season you're going to harvest, but usually it's about 50% of the medium size, and the other 50% is uh, depend on you have uh, jumbos or smaller uh, sweet potatoes or storage roots. So a commercial grower would have to decide depending on what the market is. Yeah, if you can sell the the jumbos at the same price of the uh, medium size, I would recommend the uh, harvest as, as late as you have as you can, because you allow the sweet potato to grow as much as uh, possible, as long as the temperature and soil moisture are uh, favorable. Remember that the low temperatures are going to affect them. Uh, normally, before harvesting sweet potato, you condition the sweet potato because the, the skin is very sensitive very uh, easy to detach and produce these uh, symptoms that you see on the top uh, right picture. Those are not rotten. These are just being skinned and they were not cured properly. So the, the wound dehydrated and they look ugly and very unappealing for sale. Yeah, the sweet potatoes inside that are perfectly edible, but the look is very unfavorable in comparison to the middle one. So usually to favor skin set, what is done is uh, divine the field before harvest for five, seven days before harvest, you divine it and let all that for just dry and the vines cut off and dry off. Uh, you can do that with a hedge trimmer. We have Patrick Byers here with a hedge trimmer, uh, mowing some sweet potatoes there. You can use a weed eater if you're uh, for a for a small uh, plot. F uh, commercial growers use a flail mower or vine snatcher. Yeah, that's a more commercial, like you see on the on the picture here on the left. Uh, that's a driven driven by a tractor, and they they do that pretty fast in the field. So after that, you can harvest the, the sweet potato normally for a. A garden, you can use the garden forks, uh, fork to just uh, dig and loosen the soil and pull out the, the, the sweet potatoes from there. If you are a little bigger, you can use an undercutting to
to lose the soil and then you can put by pull by hand the, the whole plant. Yeah. But for our farmer, larger farmers, commercial farmers, they usually use a chain digger that lift the roots uh, from the soil, lift the, the whole roots and soil. And then when they go through the chain, the soil falls first and the potatoes fall behind on top of the soil. So there you can come after with uh, by hand, the, the, the commercial farmers uh, hire a, a crew of people that will harvest all those by hand. And as they harvest them, they will separate it by uh, size. Uh, here you have another way to do it. Uh, you can use a, a disc, disc plow too to turn the soil. And as you see in the left picture, the uh, sweet potatoes are exposed there and you can come with the crew after all by hand picking those sweet potatoes. And also there is a more mechanized type of harvest that you see for commercial growers uh, where the, the same chain digger picks up the whole soil and potatoes and separate the soil and on the platform on top, the, the crew is separating the sweet potatoes by size into different boxes. And uh, normally after harvest, uh, you wanna cure the sweet potatoes uh, and then storage if you wanna sell them later in the season. But we can talk about that in another occasion. Uh, for now, that's all what I have. And if you have any question, Hey, thank you, Ramon. That was great information. And next will be Kathy Meacham telling us about the chestnut roast. Well, it doesn't look like I have that ability to uh, it's it's giving me a I um a pop-up. I'll I'll try them. It's it's giving me a Question. Oh, here we go. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So the festival this year is uh, going to be held in person with safety precautions in place, of course, as well as online. And uh, this is their 15th year. And um, it's a, a family friendly, free, open to the public uh, event. And so for those that uh, can attend in person, there's uh, the opportunity for fresh roasted chestnut samples, a, a tour of the uh, historic Hickman home, live demonstrations, lots of kids activities, just a, a really fun day for anyone that can attend. And of course, you have the online option as well for uh, some of the events. The uh, And some of those events in, include uh, growing the chestnuts, uh, silver pasture overview, Paw Paw Production with Patrick Beyer, Mushroom Inoculation, and Elderberry Uses. There's also I, going to be some cooking demonstrations um, by Cheryl Recker. This is uh, New Franklin is close to Boonville, if you know where that is. The address is here. The, uh, you can check out the online at this uh, YouTube channel. This picture is just a view of the Research Center. It is a beautiful place. If you've never been, this is a great opportunity and uh, no registration is needed. You just show up and you will be asked to sign in and then also be entered for a chance to win prizes. So if anybody needs more direction than that, please let me know or I'll put the, um, I'll drop the um, website for the uh, research center in the chat. And that's all I have on that. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Debbie is now going to tell us about why nuts are small and not filling properly. And thanks, Jennifer. And, and I don't necessarily have a PowerPoint, but I just wanted to share some information with you. Uh, Dr. Hank Stelzer on campus, our state extension forestry specialist, has been getting quite a number of phone calls coming in um, and that he shared with us as far as why walnuts, pecans, hickories, why some of those nuts, even the acorns on some of the oak trees, uh, appear to be much smaller than what is normal. And he said that um, they're coming in from uh, kind of all over the state, but in some areas more than others. And looking at the map on where those calls are coming from, they're coming from a lot of the, the locations where they haven't had a lot of moisture. 
And at the point of time when those flowers start developing the, the fruit nut, um, they develop the endosperm first, and then they fill in from the outside of the nut to the inside of the nut, which I thought awfully interesting. I'm not a, a, a nut guru by any means, but I just thought that was fascinating because I generally see things as growing larger from like a tomato is a small and then it gets bigger and larger and grows that way. Whereas with the nuts, it's the opposite way. They set the outside and then they grow inward. Uh, but he said with the amount of rainfall that some locations have not been able to get this year in some areas, more or less in a drought, he said that he is seeing quite a bit of smaller nuts on a lot of trees and even some of them may not fill completely. So I just wanted to pass that along in case you guys are, are looking at some of the trees in your own landscape or walking through the woods or if you've got a couple of nut trees on your property um, and you had that thought in mind. So I just wanted to let you know. So that makes me then go to, as Pat Canan had said that, you know, there's a lot of locations that, that are still dry, even though we're starting to get a little bit of rain. And so making sure that we water our trees is just as important as watering our um, vegetables and our flowers as well in order to get them for full production. Thanks, Jennifer. All right, thank you, Debbie. Moving on to our next topic, uh, that it, it is on fall sanitation of the garden and Kelly McGowan is going to tell us what we need to do going into winter and how to prepare the, the garden. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Can you see that? Yes, I can. All right, so let's talk a little bit about sanitation in the fall garden. It is coming to the time when we need to start thinking about this. So I'm gonna share a few things to keep in mind as we go into the fall season. And I do want to thank my colleague Donna Oftenberg for uh, letting me use this presentation that she put together. So our goals with cleaning up in the fall are to reduce the amount of disease issues that might be overwintering on garden debris. Things like fungal diseases, those spores can overwinter on garden debris. So we want to think about reducing those sticking around in the garden. There are also uh, insect pests and egg masses that can overwinter on garden debris as well. And we also wanna reduce the amount of weed seeds in that area. Okay, so as far as the general landscape, we want to remove anything that's dead or diseased um, after the plant has went dormant. And the, basically the way you wanna do that is you wanna cut it to within two to three inches of the crown of the plant. If anything's tall or lanky, those are usually the ones that get cut back. Anything that's dead as far as stems, you wanna get those out of there. Now, if you do just have some general native plants that haven't had, a, haven't had an issue with disease or anything else, do consider leaving some garden debris out over the winter, just because things like hollow stems um, are a great place for some of our beneficial insects to overwinter. Um, this is a good time to do some minor pruning of broken twigs and small branches, but you really want to delay mulching these plants until the ground totally freezes and then uh, removing fallen leaves are a good idea as well. As far as the vegetable garden, uh, before we get a frost, uh, you wanna clean up and dispose of fallen fruit and disease plant material throughout the growing season. So always keep your garden nice and clean and those things cleaned up. After we have our first frost, that's the time you wanna pull up any plants and destroy any plants that were disease or insect infested. And remember a lot of insect, or insect pests and disease issues can survive the composting process. So um, if you do have plants that didn't have a disease issue, by all means compost those. If they did, you probably wanna dispose of those in another manner. Um, like burning. 
certainly pull any weeds that are in the vegetable garden. We don't want those to um, drop seeds on the ground. And so you're gonna have continual problems with those weeds. Go ahead and take out any cages or trellising panels, anything like that. Disinfect them with a 10% bleach solution. And then just remove anything that insect pests can overwinter in or under in the vegetable garden. So just debris, boards, anything like that that's going to give them habitat. Now remember, these are insect pests and not our beneficial insects. As far as the home orchard, if you do have fruit plants, pick up any fallen or spoiled fruit, remove any mummy fruit, which is just basically fruit that has deteriorated but is still attached to the mother plant. This is a good time to remove any spent blackberry or raspberry canes. Uh, do minor pruning on broken or diseased branches, but any major pruning, you wanna save that for uh, the dormant season. And then think about your equipment and your tools, uh, put up hoses and make sure that your water sources are uh, taken care of before freezing weather sets in. Wash, dry and oil tools, um, things like that. Cause you know, those tools can be quite pricey and we wanna take care of them as much as possible. Okay, and I think that is it, Jennifer. Okay, thank you, Kelly. And our last topic is on planting trees and shrubs. Fall is a good time to do that. And Kathy is going to wrap us up by telling us about uh, planting the trees and shrubs now. Thank you, Jennifer. All right, well, I really am talking more about the trees today and um, that is the wrong slide. That I'm so sorry, this started from the beginning of another presentation. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is the time of year that we're thinking about this and I uh, just wanna give a little overview of uh, there, that's where I wanted to start from the beginning. Nope, it just keeps going back. Um, uh, yeah, just a second. <laughs> Sorry for this. I thought I could add it to the end of another larger presentation I'm doing. So I'm just going to, it, it'll just, can, can you see this? Yes, I can see it. I think you just need to hit from current slide. Oh, how smart of you, Jennifer, thank you. <laughs> from current slide, so fall tree planting. The first there thing you, you wanna do, yeah, first thing you wanna do is think about where you're gonna plant it. Um, so you wanna think about, you know, Justin talked about the soil, you want to think about taking a soil test and um, how you're going to water the plant. Uh, you, is the watering close or are you going to have to bring water in? Is your water source close? Some plants can't take as much light as others, can't take the full sun. So you want to think about that. And really important, you want to make sure you've got enough space for where you want to put the plant. And if you do these things beforehand, you can really save yourself trouble in the end. Just quickly, I wanted to tell you, if you're thinking about any of these uh, species, you might wanna wait until the spring. So the planting hole is very important. Once you have your, your site picked out, um, uh, you may have heard this before, the diameter should be two to three times larger than the depth, and that is very important. It's important so those roots can spread out and um, you absolutely, don't want to plant the tree too deep. You want to plant it uh, no deeper than the soil ball, uh, the root ball. And you, if it comes in, a, if you've purchased a tree in a container, tree or shrub in a container, don't plant it any deeper than what that tree is in, as is in the container. Um, if you plant too deep, 
this can happen and it will happen. You, it will, this means the death of the tree. It might not happen the first year. It might even not happen the first five years, but it will be, um, it will be detrimental to the tree. Also, you can do a little pruning at planting. You want to avoid excessive pruning of the tops or the roots. And, but you do wanna remove any broken limbs or crossing branches. And you would wanna correct any uh, serious structural problems. So if there's uh, some narrow uh, branch angles or narrow crotches, you would wanna correct that. This is a, a real good uh, drawing of before pruning and after pruning. So you're looking for, as you can see, more of a scaffolding effect for uh, that after pruning. If the plant needs to be staked, you wanna make sure that you do it low enough to allow some top movement of the tree. You shouldn't have a tree staked for over uh, the first year unless it's in extreme conditions. But if the tree relies on that support, then the roots aren't developing the, the way they should and won't be strong enough for the tree. Uh, watering is of course very important. And uh, just as Debbie mentioned, it is the number one cause of death of newly planted trees and shrubs. Uh, so that's overwatering and underwatering. And the best uh, way to water a newly planted tree or shrub is with small quantities for the at least the first month after planting. And uh, just know that that soil ball can dry out very quickly. And uh, so here's a couple of uh, pictures of some methods that uh, this gator, a gator bag is one way, and this um, uh, this drip irrigation is the other, this drip circle is another way. And um, you should continue watering, and Debbie mentioned this too, um, into the fall and um, uh, a woody plant is considered established uh, when the watering cycle can be extended to two weeks during warm weather. But before that, you are watering every, you're checking these at least every other day. And mulching, uh, again, very important. You can see on the left, what we call a donut. You wanna mulch in a donut and you do not wanna mulch in a volcano. Uh, the volcano method is just, it's all, it's like planting the tree too deeply. Uh, eventually this is really going to uh, hurt the tree and um, it's not going to be able to get uh, what it needs to survive. This is a good picture of, of how someone mulched this tree uh, all the way out to the drip line um, of those branches. And um, it's just, uh, now you may not, uh, have the space to do something this large, but if you do, it uh, can really benefit the tree because the tree is in competition with grass for um, for water and nutrients. You want to mulch about between two and four inches and probably not much deeper than that. This is just a review of um, the staking, mulching, planting. I didn't mention wrapping, but if you're planting a, young, a new tree this, um, uh, this fall, it's imp you might as well go ahead and uh, get some of the wrap and uh, that'll help with sun scald. It'll also help with um, rabbits and other uh, small animals chewing on that tender bark. You can get that at a, a, a box store, a Lowe's, possibly Walmart. And it's just a brown paper that you wrap up uh, from the bottom up on the, on the trunk. I also didn't mention fertilizing because there's, it's not very, it's not really necessary when you're first planting a tree, but if so, just a very lightly fertilizing. And uh, Justin mentioned that as well. You don't want to over fertilize if it's not needed for uh, reasons he mentioned. And if you get that soil test, you'll know beforehand. And that's all I have. All right, thank you, Kathy. And I'm going to turn it back over to Debbie to wrap us up. Thank you, Jennifer, and um, everyone that's presented. It's it's nice to to hear all the different topics and to renew our minds on on all these different things that we can do with our landscapes, gardens, and um, yards. So we appreciate um, everyone presenting today. Again, here's the topic and from uh, our email addresses of all of us that are here. Um, just a reminder that we are live streaming right now. If you go to YouTube. 
just type into the section at the top here, MUIPM, and you'll see the live stream. If you want to look at um, the live stream content information of the past live streams you didn't see, click on a live stream and then below the actual live stream itself, it is say um, show more. You can click on share more and it will tell you specifically the different topics that are being presented on that particular archived live stream past event. So I wanted to share that with you as well. And our upcoming, uh, we will meet again next week on September 29th. And we hope to see you then. Have a great week.